thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about our work on honeybees. Um, my lab works on uh, the molecular aspects of honeybees, but I assure you that bees do feature in this talk, even though you may reach a stage where you wonder if they do. Um, <laughs> don't worry. Um, so these are my two favorite pieces of biology. Uh, this one you know, this one you probably don't know. And so part of my talk is really going to introduce you to this. And hopefully, as we're all biologists, I think everybody that keeps bees at heart is a biologist, it will be of interest to you before I present our bee work. So I'm going to talk a little bit to you about developmental biology. We work on bee <coughs> developmental biology. I'm going to tell you that it's not just about the DNA in your bodies and cells right now, or indeed in bee cells that's important. I'm going to discuss with you this concept of epigenetics that you may have read about. It's becoming quite a popular piece of uh, science. And I promise you, there are bees. Uh, I'm going to start with this, um, this beautiful fresco by Raphael, actually, which uh, is on a wall in the Vatican. You may have seen it. Um, and it really is a, a beautiful piece of work, but also a very clever piece of work by Raphael. And the two protagonists in the center of his... Um, uh, fresco are Plato on the left uh, and Aristotle on the right. And being the playful sort of chap that Raphael was, you can see that he's got Plato pointing to the sky, his thoughts are in the, in, 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 in the heavens, if you like, and his belief in the forms, whereas Aristotle is pointing at the ground. And the reason why Aristotle is someone that most scientists admire is that he was really the first person to systematically study biology as a subject. And it was based on his own empirical observations of what was happening around him. And the reason why he, and, and sorry, his, his major contribution was this nine volume work, are really the first books written about animals and their biology. Uh, and he inferred a number of kind of behavioral um, implications from studying these animals. But most importantly, I think, he developed this idea that organisms develop from unformed cells. And that kind of sounds like a weird concept now, but remember this was in 350 BC, this is a long time ago. And the reason why he, uh, one of the reasons and one of the themes running through his book was to really rebuke at the time what we, the, the view of developmental biology and the origin of animals was that we were preformed. And what you're looking at here is a sperm cell and you can see the head of a little baby. You can see it's holding its knees with its little arms. And this was the prevailing view of life and how life originated up into the 20th century until microscopes allowed us to look at sperm cells and appreciate the fact that there was no preformed baby in a sperm cell. And he discussed this in his book in the context of honeybees. And in one of the chapters from 350 BC, he wrote, all persons are not agreed as to the generation of bees. For some say that they neither produce young nor have sexual intercourse, but that they bring their young from other sources. And some say that they collect them from the flowers of the calintris and others from the flower of the calamus. Others again say that they are found in the flowers of olives. And they produce this proof that the swarms are most abundant when the olives are fertile. No surprise. Other persons affirm that the rulers, queens, produce the young of the bees. And, and so the origins of animals, including bees, was a real mystery. And this guy was the first to kind of suggest that actually animals develop from single cells and they go through this gradual kind of growth and develop into a formed structure from what was essentially an unformed cell. That's 350 BC that he proposed that that may well be how animal development works. And of course, we know a little bit more now. And, and now we can actually image this. Uh, and we know that, that his theory, his central tenet about epigenesis was in fact true. And we now know that we go through this kind of growth and decline. And from that single cell that was formed by fusion of a nucleus from your father and a nucleus from your mother, from that single cell, we produce about 37 trillion, that's 12 zeros, 37 trillion cells in an average adult male or female human being, all originating from that one cell. So what's so remarkable about that? 
But what's remarkable about that, if one thinks about it, is that all that complex information that has to happen to go from a single cell into something like me is based on our genetic material. This is probably the most recognizable scientific structure to non-scientists, and it was solved by Watson and Crick in Cambridge, along with Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin. And the structure of DNA in the 50s really set the scene for what I'm going to talk to you about today, which is, which is B genetics and genomics. And so within your cells right now, the ones that contain DNA are about 22,000 genes. And those 22,000 genes are in this much bigger structure that we call the genome, which is the entire collection of DNA in your cells right now. And it's those genes that ultimately produce the formed organism from the unformed organism. And there's a lot of it. So just to give you a kind of sense of scale of the complexity of what we're talking about and the amount of what we're talking about, you've got about 37 trillion cells in your body right now. About 80% of them are red blood cells. And red blood cells don't contain DNA. So if we get rid of those and think about the 20% of cells in your bodies right now that contain DNA, they have about two meters of DNA in each cell. And if you laid all that DNA end to end from those cells, you've got about 6.2 billion kilometers of DNA in your bodies right now. And to put that into some kind of scale, that's about 41 trips to the moon and back from Earth. It's an incomprehensible amount of DNA. And of course, the question is, how do we begin to untangle this? And how do we untangle it not only in the context of human disease, which is what a lot of my colleagues work on, but in the context of, of honeybee biology? And it's this that I'm going to try and uh, elucidate. Uh, for anyone else that's interested, it's also equivalent to about a trip to Neptune from Earth and halfway back. And we know DNA is important. Why do we know DNA is important? Well, unfortunately, if you get a mutation in your DNA sequence, it can lead to disease. And it can also, during development, a mutation can lead to catastrophic consequences whereby that organism stops development partway through. So we know that DNA is important. But over the last few years, we've realized that there's something else, OK? the mystery. And what is this mystery? Well, I'm going to give you two kind of examples of why we know there's something else. And we've known for a long time. The first is, uh, and here's the B, um, the first is that there's no absolute relationship between the complexity of an organism, the complexity of its behavior, the number of neurons it has in its brain, and the number of genes in its cells. So for instance, if you look at humans, there's about 22,000 genes. There's maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. 22,000 genes, it's the same number in mouse and whales. But if you look at the number of neurons, the number of neurons produced from the same number of genes varies actually almost twofold between humans and whales. And we may or may not argue that we have more behavioral complexity than a whale, but who knows? But look at plants. Some species of plants have more than 30,000 genes, which is more than humans have, but they have no neurons. And they don't show any kind of complex behavior and are generally stationary in the ground. So do you see what I mean? That the number of genes is no relationship to the complexity of the animal. And not only that, but if you look at the honeybee, our favorite insect, if you look at the honeybee in the context of things like Drosophila, which is a, which is a fruit fly, you can see that the honeybee has exactly the same number of genes as flies, but in terms of neurons, we know it's the smartest insect. That's why we love it. That's why we're here today. And it has four times the number of neurons than a fly, even though it has the same amount of genes. So what's going on here? How's, how, how's this possible? And my favorite experimental example to illustrate before I move on of, of exactly what I'm talking about, that it can't just be about DNA, is this experiment by someone that I was lucky enough to work with for a few years when I was in Cambridge. And this is a guy called John Gurdon. This is in his graduate days. And what John did was a, was a beautifully simple experiment that had profound implications for really how we thought about uh, genetics and about biology. And what John did, he worked on xenopus, on frogs. And he took from an albino frog 
a piece of intestine and he removed single cells from the intestine. So these are kind of just gut epithelial cells, probably the most bog standard cell in your body. Nothing exciting about a gut epithelial cell, unless perhaps you're a gut epithelial cell. And what he did is that he removed these single cells from the albino frog, and that was crucial. He chose an albino frog because albinoism in frogs is called by a genetic mutation, and it means that he could follow those cells because they had this mutation. And that was crucial because what he did next, he took the nucleus out of these cells containing the DNA and he popped it into a frog embryo and popped the embryo, sorry, the egg rather, back into the frog. And he produced a frog. He produced a white albino frog. And here is mum, the brown, and these are all the progenies she produced by this experiment. And what did that say? It said something absolutely profound. And remember, this was done in the 50s, just after DNA had been discovered. What it said was that all cells have the ability to become anything else. They all have the same DNA. You can take the DNA in a gut cell, and if you put it in the right, if you put it in the right environment, i.e. an egg, it has the potential to form all the other cell types that form an adult animal. And that was revolutionary at the time. Because what it said was that the, the DNA in neuronal cells is the same as DNA in liver cells, in cardiac cells, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't just me that thought this was a good experiment. So did the Nobel Committee. Um, and this is John with his Nobel Prize gong uh, that he was awarded for this work. Because it pioneered the use of stem cells in, in human biology. But the take-home message from these last two slides is, is that it's not just about your DNA. And amusingly, and John has this in his office, this is his school report, his biology school report. And it is an interesting read. It's available online. But just to pick out a little highlight, he's very proud of it. He has it framed in his desk. He said, um, it has been a disastrous half. His work has been far from satisfactory. Um, I believe he has ideas about becoming a scientist. On his present showing, this is quite ridiculous. If he doesn't learn simple biological facts, he would have no chance of working as a specialist, and it would be a sheer waste of time, both on his part and those that have to teach him. <laughs> there you go. Um, and that just shows you that however, whatever your school report's like is no limitation, ultimately. Um, and this is what I want you to take away before we get on to kind of bees. And that is that we are all formed from a single cell, which is your mum and your dad's nuclei fusing together, and then you get the development of an adult organism. And from this one cell, you produce all the other cells in your body. So genetics and the genome of an organism is kind of a script. It's what's possible, okay? But the way in which this DNA script is read and interpreted is the transcript. So you have this fixed, preformed genome that you get half from your mum, half from your dad. But what happens next during development and as an adult is about how that same fixed genetic code is read and interpreted to produce all the different cells in your body. And we have a great example of epigenetics. This concept of something more than the genetics of the DNA is called epigenetics, which is a nod back to Aristotle and his epigenesis. And it's Greek for on top. So epigenetics is on top of DNA. This extra stuff I'm talking about. And we have a great example. So everyone in this room right now is 99.9% .9 identical in terms of their DNA. But we look different. We have different abilities. Okay, and if you wrote out all the letters of your genome, it would be about 260,000 pages. And of those 260,000 A4 pages with all the letters of your DNA, we would differ from each other by about 500 pages. So we're almost identical. So is it that 0.1% that results in this difference? Or is it this other stuff I'm talking about? Well, okay, Paul, if it's the 0.1%, Show me something that's identical. 
So genetically identical twins. These two are a little bit scary. I call them Chuck, Chuckle, <laughs> the Chucky twins. Uh, these two are a little bit more beautiful. Um, these are genetically identical twins, okay? To the letter of their DNA, they are identical. Not 0.1% not different like we all are. They're 100% identical because they're formed by, by one zygote that splits into two. They share the same placenta as their mum. So all through their development, same placenta as their mum, they share the same placenta from their mum. And all their way through the de development, they're experiencing the same environment in utero. So these should all show identical characteristics if it's all about DNA, right? But they don't. So if you look at the percentage of identical twins who are the same for something, if you look at something like height, so you're looking at the white bars on this diagram, if you look at something like height, then genetically identical twins are usually the same height. About 80% of genetically identical twins are, this, are the same height throughout their life, which implies a strong kind of genetic component to that process. But if you look further down the list as the white bar kind of shrinks, and you look at things like breast cancer, Crohn's disease, stroke, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, then actually there seems to be a very little genetic component to these, because two identical twins may only have a 20% chance of both developing any of these conditions implying that unless you're one of those identical twin pairs that stays together wearing the same clothes all your lives and sharing exactly the same environment, it's these differing environments over the age of an organism that mean that even if you're genetically identical, you don't have the same susceptibility to these kinds of diseases. And this is not just related to us. This is a blue bottle. I'm getting closer to insects, not the one we want yet. This is the blue bottle, and this is the maggot of the blue bottle. This is a perfect demonstration of what I'm talking about. These are the same animal, right, in terms of their DNA, because, and the monarch butterfly shows it beautifully as well, this caterpillar becomes the butterfly. This maggot becomes the fly. They don't suddenly gain extra genes in order to become a fly or a butterfly. It's, it, it's genetically identical to the organism that they, they become. But it's a perfect demonstration of how this fixed genome and genetics of this caterpillar is rewired during pupation and ultimately from exactly the same genetic blueprint produces this, which obviously differs remarkably from this. And the same is true here. <coughs> An environment has a huge effect on this process, as I just showed you with the identical twins. So you probably, I don't know whether you can see this very well. Does anybody know what this is? And if you've seen me speak before, you probably already know. That's what everyone says, and it is actually looks really like a wood ant, isn't it? But you wouldn't really want to poke around it in exactly the same way. And this is a, a crocodile nest. And this is mum sat on top of the crocodile nest. Does anybody know why crocodile mums are, are really kind of focused on sitting on top of their nests? So if I wanted to determine who was male and female in this room right now, you could blindfold me, we could take a swab from inside of everyone's cheek, I could go away to the lab, I could sequence the DNA, and I would be able to tell who was female and who was male, because males have this Y chromosome which means that when you sequence their DNA or look at their DNA, they're different. Crocodiles use temperature to, term, to determine sex, and a lot of reptiles do as well. So if I took DNA from a female and male crocodile and sequenced it, I would not be able to tell which was the male and female. And this is an example of how sex determination, something as important as sex determination, whether you're male or female, is based on an environmental effect, which is temperature, and at one temperature that the eggs are incubated, you get males, and at a different temperature, you get females. So environment can have a really big, strong an impact on this kind of process. And these are a couple more examples. These are P. aphids, the kind of blight of anybody that grows tomatoes and things like that. You can see that these two aphids are genetically identical. This one has wings and this one doesn't. Aphids produce winged offspring literally like that in response to resource limitation. Daphnia, water fleas, you can see on the left, 
This is an unarmored Daphnia. This is what happens to a Daphnia if you put a predator, or if it's, in the, um, if it's in the locale of a predator. They grow these defense structures, like these huge caps, or these huge spikes, which makes them pretty unedible. Butterflies are another great example. Changes in wing, format, in wing patterning in, in butterflies is an extremely common environmentally driven event, whereby in spring or in drought, uh, sorry, in spring or in autumn, in uh, wet season or dry season, the same butterfly can change its wing pattern. And of course we know I have another insect that is driven by an environmental cue. <laughs> And that is the fact that queen bees and worker bees are what they eat. Queen bees eat royal jelly, worker bees eat um, kind of a nectar pollen high carbohydrate diet. And it's all to do with this. Can you just play the video, please? It's all to do with this molecule. And this is what DNA looks like in the human body. It's called a nucleosome. I'm not going to dwell on this. I'm going to show you it in a different way. But this is how your genomic DNA looks in your cells right now. And if you look in a powerful microscope, this is your DNA in your cells right now. And these little blobs are this structure. And this structure is eight proteins, like fist-like proteins together, with a little piece of DNA wrapped around it. And that repeats all through your genome in your cells. But in order to explain it, I'm going to show you it in terms of strawberry laces, marshmallows, and jelly tots, and of course, other confectionery manufacturers are available. And this is a brilliant analogy that is based on a brilliant scientist called Professor Nessa Carey, who presents this kind of complex idea in a more accessible way. And she wrote an excellent book on epigenetics, a popular science book, and bees feature quite heavily in her book. So I highly recommend it, unless I've completely turned you off this subject by the end of my talk. So why, am I, why does, we, did Nessa kind of use this analogy? Well, the, the strawberry laces look like DNA, and these eight fist-shaped proteins that I told you about clump together like marshmallows, and these little cocktail sticks that I'm sticking out of the side are the tails that, um, that I probably should have pointed out on this slide. Sorry, let me just point that out. Um, the, the tails that you can see sticking out. And these are important, and I'll tell you why. OK. <clears throat> and here we go. I'm just showing you kind of a rendering in a different way of that a microscope image I showed you before. Here's the DNA, and here are those eight marshmallows. And that's the repeating structure of your genomes right now. And what happens is, um, is there any beekeepers in the audience? I think there's a few. Um, so. I don't know, you're two months into the season and, you know, the hives are going crazy and, 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 you know, you're doing a lot of work making sure they don't swarm and you get home after a long day and you think, oh, I'll just have a beer to take the edge off. It's been a long day. So you have a beer and that's fine. And, and, and then you get a bit later in the season and you're having to move supers around and, you know, it's becoming hard work and you get home and you think, oh, I'll have a beer to take the edge off. And then you know it's actually, you need two or three beers to take the edge off later in the season. And that's because your genes respond to the environment. And in this case, albeit a trivial example, is drinking. And it could be anything. You have a drink, you switch genes on in your body that metabolize alcohol. And the way that works is that you get these little jelly tots, these little modifications that are made to these little fish-shaped proteins and these little modifications say, OK, this gene needs to be switched on, and we're going to keep it switched on. And because you start metabolizing alcohol better, OK, it remains switched on. But then it's the end of the season. You've, you've treated with Max. The bees have been locked down, and you go on holiday. And you think, oh, I should probably knock it on the head a little bit. So you stop drinking. And the genes that are associated with metabolizing alcohol also stop. And instead of having the green jelly tots, they're switched for black jelly tops. Jelly pops, jelly top, um, jelly tots. And this kind of switching on and off of genes by making these little modifications, which are signals from your liver saying, hey, you know, more alcohol, we need to metabolize it, is 
this information that's on top of your DNA, that is in addition to your DNA. And it's not only those fist-shaped proteins that you can modify, it's also the DNA sequence itself. And you can add little chemical signals to these DNA as well. And you add little chemical signals to DNA as well because it really tightens up these marshmallows together and it means that those genes in your genome may not be switched on again throughout your entire life. And it's like, oh, that's a bit weird. Why would that happen? Well, think about your neurons or something. Your neurons don't make hemoglobin. Well, why? Because they've got the gene for hemoglobin because every cell has the same genome. Well, they don't make hemoglobin because those genes are locked up for the lifetime of those neurons. And so how do we study this in the context of bees? And how do we study it in the context of human biology? And it's a really hot area in human biology. And the, and the way in which we, we do it is that we, use sequ we sequence genomes. We sequence all the DNA in an organism or within a cell of an organism. And this diagram, does anybody know who this guy is? We probably don't. This guy had a really good idea and formed a company called Intel. Um, and he's called Gordon Moore. And what you're looking at here in this white line is Moore's law. And this is a representation of the doubling of computer power every two years. And any technology that can mirror that kind of doubling of power every two years is considered to be doing extremely well. You know, it's associated with doubling of computer power. And when we sequence the first human genome, you can see that, that actually the technology associated with it was following Moore's law. And what they did was that they had huge warehouses filled with these machines that sequenced the first human genome. And it cost a fortune and involved a huge number of people. But what's happened since? What's happened since is that sequencing DNA in humans, in bees, has got really, really cheap. It, and it's out-competing Moore's law. Why is that? Well, instead of having warehouses full of these all over the world, you can now do it with one machine. Okay? And not only can you do it with one machine for about $1,000, you can now even sequence human genomes with something that plugs into your USB and literally fits in your top pocket. And this is one. We sequence B genomes on here, and you can sequence human genomes on here. And things are really changing, and this is, you know, the excitement around genome medicine is all being driven by these kind of technologies. But we use it to study insects, and here we go. So here is a pie chart of all the animal life on Earth, and reassuringly, humans are a very, very, very small slice of life on the planet. Vertebrates in general are, so chordates are somewhere around here, and about 11% of vertebrates are, are, are mammals, and chordates are about 20% or so of animal life. This is insects here. And if you look at the distribution of carbon on the planet, and obviously any living organism has carbon, then you can see that the majority of organisms on this planet are plants. We know this. This is one of the reasons we love pollinators. And if you look at the slice of animal carbon on the planet, which is right down here, then you can see that the majority of carbon that's in animals is actually in arthropods. And we know that the majority of arthropods, about 80%, are insects. And just to give some kind of numbers and scale on this, the number of, peop the number of people on Earth is about 7.7 .7 billion. The number of individual insects on Earth is about a billion billion. And of course, eusocial insects are extremely successful. And our favorite eusocial insect, of course, is the wasp, isn't it? That's why we're all here, to look at the wasp. But these eusocial insects, so wasps, unfortunately, ants, termites, and bees, are the most successful group of insects. So not only do insects represent the most number of species, the most fixed carbon on Earth, the majority of insect species, sorry, the, the, the majority of insect species are not these eusocial animals. So bees, wasps, termites, etc., only account for about 2% of insect species, but they account for 80% of insect biomass. So they're a tiny proportion of the number of insect species, 
but they account for most of the biomass, most of the weight, if you like, of insects on the planet. So they're extremely successful. And in terms of everything else I told you about, this idea that you can get multiple outcomes or different outcomes from fixed DNA, this is the perfect example, and this is why we work on it. And the reason it's the perfect example is because you have multiple casts from a single genome. And how do you make a bee then? Because this is what we study, and I'll just go back to Aristotle, because he had something to say about bees and making bees in 350 BC. After the progeny is deposited in the cells, they incubate like birds. In the wax cells, the little worm is placed at the side. Afterwards, it rises of itself to be fed. It's united to the comb in such a manner as to be held by it. The progeny of both the bees and drones from which the little worms are produced is white. As they grow, they become bees and drones. Notice they separate. He separates the drones and calls bee, the female bees bees. Um, and, and then he goes on to kind of say, which is something I didn't know. I don't know whether any of you guys have done it. But if a person cuts off the head of a grub before its wings are acquired, the other bees devour it. Yeah, I imagine. If a person, having cut off the wings of a drone, lets it go, the bees will eat off the wings of the other drones. I'm not sure about that. There were clearly some strange beekeeping practices back in ancient Greece, uh, but it's not something that we've come across. But we know a little bit more about making a bee now, don't we? And, and this video, I think, is just worth pausing to watch. I don't know how many of you have seen it. Whoops, we know what that is. Look how dynamic what's going on in here is. Stunning. And I really recommend the website. And, and I did get permission to use this video, don't worry. Amazing. And that's what we work on. And what we want to understand is um, how the honeybee genome can produce drones, females, females. And more importantly, and what I'm going to talk about today, is this difference between the queen and the worker. Although we do actually work quite a bit on the drones. And this is an example, an excellent example, is it not, of everything that I discussed with you so far about this epigenetic, this additional DNA business, is that the honeybee genome can go one of three ways. Yes, we know that the drone has half the amount of DNA than the two females, and it's produced from an unfertilized egg. But in terms of the worker and the queen then, which we know that differ in terms of their reproductibility, they also differ in terms of their lifespan, they differ markedly in terms of their behavior. You know that, you know, I always say the queen's a boring animal and I always get rebuked for that. But I know she has an extremely high burden um, in laying eggs. But if you think about all the different behaviors that worker bees undertake in the hive and these behavioral transitions that they undertake during their lifetime, this is an astonishing animal. I think we'd all agree with that. And they also, differ with their nutrition as well we know. So unfertilized egg produces a grub that is fed a particular uh, diet and becomes a male. But if the queen lays a fertilized egg, we know that given one diet, you'll produce a worker. And we know that given um, a different structure and a different diet royal jelly, you'll produce the queen. And this perfectly demonstrates what I was talking about. This grub has the ability to become the worker or the queen. There's nothing different about this grub if it goes this way or if it goes this way. Just the food it's fed by the workers. And this is a perfect example of this switch in the genome 
of the developing larva. Is it read and interpreted this way to form a worker, or is it read and interpreted this way to form a queen? And we know it's based on whether it's given royal jelly. So what we asked ourselves a few years ago is how is it the nutrition enables changes to the marshmallows? Can we explain what's happening here based on what's happening here? And I think we, we made a pretty good go at it. And obviously, we're continuing to do it. Um, and indeed, changes with the yellow jelly tots to the DNA. And the first evidence that actually this may be a process that's governed by epigenetics came from work by Richard Malayska in, in Australia, where he looked at the effect of preventing bees from adding yellow jelly tots to their DNA. And the way they do that is that you take grubs and you inject them with a little molecule that switches genes off. So you can inject them with this little molecule and it will stop the bees producing the genes that add these little yellow dots to their DNA. And so what happens if you do that? Well, you inject them, you grow them in dishes, you let them grow and they pupate. So you can see the queens are developing in advance of the workers as, as, as we know. But if you let them, if you let them uh, develop until adulthood, this is what you see. So this is the control group. And I was just explaining to Jed, actually, before, when you grow bees in dishes like this, you do get workers, you do get queens, but you do get some bees that are kind of, mm, are they, aren't they? And that's just a process we thought of growing them in a dish. But maybe these kind of intercast bees are more common in the hive, actually, than we probably realize. What happens now in the experiment where you switch off the gene that's adding those yellow jelly tots? You produce queens. By switching that one gene off, instead of having 80% of workers growing, you now only have 20% that are workers, and the majority of the nearly 80% are queens. And that was the first evidence that if you switch this one gene off in a developing larva, you can make them become queens, even without feeding them royal jelly. And here is a queen that's produced by this method. It's a bit ropey, but it's a queen. If you count her ovarioles, if you dissect her ovaries and count the number of ovarioles, she has a normal amount of ovarioles. And if you dissect her actual ovaries, so this is a, this is a queen that's been reared in a hive as normal, then you can see that these lab-reared queens where you switch off this single gene have very comparable ovary sizes. But what about the marshmallows? Well, this is what we contributed to this story. And what we did was that we looked during development and to see if we could understand where the similarities and differences are between queen and workers. Because that might tell us what is it in the genomes that control queen or worker and how it might relate to nutrition. And what we did, instead of doing the easy experiment, which is to collect adults, we decided, no, why don't we look at a developmental time point. And we chose 96 hours after the grub hatches. And the reason for that is that a lot of studies from the 50s shown that if you try and graft after this age, you tend not to produce queens, i.e. whatever decision is being made here at the level of genes is determined somewhere around here. And you probably know as beekeepers that if you graft larvae that are too old, then your success of them grafting is, is much more diminished. And so we look at this kind of stage. So this is kind of photographs through bee development. So it's when the grub is kind of still curved around the chamber. OK, it's not gone upright. And obviously, the queen we take at a similar um, um, uh, time. And this means that we do a hell of a lot of this, a hell of a lot of caging the queen and making sure that we're collecting eggs of, an, of, of as exact as we possibly can, that we know the ages of the eggs usually within an hour. Um, and we also use the NICOT system quite a bit. And you know we do a, a lot of grafting. And we used to actually come to see Jed um, to buy grafted queens as well. So we do a lot of that, but we also do a lot of that. 
and that is to combine the beauty of the B system and the development of the B system in identifying using genomic technologies, using state-of-the-art research um, techniques to try and look at whether we can see where in the B genomes are specifying queen and where in the genome are specifying worker. And we use the machines that I told you about before, including the one in my pocket. And what we do is that we use antibodies that enable us to detect where in the genome of the bees those marshmallows are with the purple jelly tots. And we use antibodies to detect where in the bee genome those marshmallows are with the red jelly tots or yellow jelly tots, et cetera. And what do we do? Well, we use computers. This is quite a demanding process in terms of uh, computational power. The honeybee genome was sequenced a few years ago now and is available online as a free resource. And so we do the bee work, we do the lab work, and then we do the computational work in order to map the queen and the worker during development to see whether we can find out where the secrets are in the honeybee genome. And I'm just going to show you a little bit of data. Uh, I think it's, it's always nice to see real data, and I'll do my best uh, to explain it in a way uh, that's understandable. So we looked, and I'm showing you here three different colored jelly tots. These are three different little marks on the marshmallows. And when we looked at where, where these were in 96-hour workers and 96-hour queens, what we found were that all these little chemical tags on the marshmallows were in genes. So, all the, so the majority of the honeybee genes, about 70% of all the honeybee genes that we looked at, contained these three little epigenetic marks. Well, that's okay. That means that we've picked some good marks to look at because they represent 60% of all the genes. You don't want to be looking at 2% of the genes. But the important thing to is, is not what's in common, but perhaps what's not common between the queen and the worker. And what I'm showing you here is called a volcano plot, and all you really need to know is that anything that colored is different. Blue is worker, queen is red, and if you look for each one of these different colored jelly tots, there are thousands of unique regions in the worker and thousands of unique regions in the queen for these epigenetic marks. So each one of these dots is a place in the worker genome that is different for this jelly tot than in the queen. And there are thousands of differences between the queens and the workers. And because all these marks are on genes, you can say, well, OK, so is there anything in common about these genes? What are these gene, where are these gene differences? It's not because workers are drinking beer and queens aren't, like the trivial example I gave you earlier. Where are they? And interestingly, if you look at this 96-hour time frame, then what's happening in the worker and what's happening in the queen is very different. The queen is growing. She's, she's kind of already on the path to being a queen, okay? Her, her kind of, her, her, the reading of her genome has already been set and she's growing. If you look at the worker and what's happening in the worker, all the worker unique regions, which aren't carrying the jelly tots that the queen genome does, are all to do with the development neuronally. And that kind of makes sense to us because the worker, I think, in many ways, is a more complex animal just because of the number of tasks she performs. And here, I'm showing you, if you look at all the genes that have switched on, if you look at all the genes in a queen honeybee uh, or larva compared to a worker honeybee, and you say, OK, how different are the genes that are switched on in the worker compared to the genes that are switched on in the queen? You can see, firstly, actually, individual bees vary quite a bit. OK? So you can see that the distance between all these dots represents how different they are. That's all you need to know. And so you can see here that queens, so five individual queens. No, sorry, four, is it? I can't remember. It's four or five. Four individual queens show variation in their own little gene programs, but they still cluster together and are separate from the workers, which show a totally different set of genes being switched on. And you can see that here again with one of these little dots. All these are genes in the worker, 
that aren't switched on in the queen, and all these represent genes that are switched on in the queen, but not in the worker. And there are hundreds of differences from this same genome. And again, if you look at the genes that are on in the queen and the genes that are on in the worker, again, you see the fact that in the worker, it's all to do with neurogenesis and brain development, whereas the queen is just getting bigger and bigger. And so you can kind of, and I sometimes kind of cry a little bit on the inside at reducing the beauty of bees to something like this. But this is kind of what, what science generally is. And what I'm showing you here again are all the data put together for workers, two separate pieces of data, it's not really important, and, and this is the queen. And for one of these jelly tots, I think this is purple, is it, or red maybe, I just, it doesn't matter. You can see that workers and queens are totally different. And not only that, drones are totally different from queen and worker. And not only that, but if you look 24 hours earlier in worker development, that's also unique. So at each stage of development, these developing organisms are different and they're unique. As is the genes that they switch on and off. Queens and workers are different from drones, which are different from 72-hour workers compared to 96 workers. So queens, workers, and drones, and their developmental age are epigenetically unique, but not genetically unique. And it controls unique patterns of gene expression. And if you'd like to read a little bit more about our work, then, then we, we have had quite a bit of exposure because it's a really interesting system, right, the honeybee. That's why we work on it. So I'm going to finish with perhaps trying to address what you probably thought my talk was about. Um, <laughs> never trust a speaker. Um, which is, are they what they eat? And of course, you've probably seen this in the press over the last couple of years, where this is a poor beekeeper in Alsace who started to have honey in his hive, all kinds of different shades of blue, reds, purples uh, in Alsace. And, and, and they, they kind of worked it out that the bees were taking sugar from an M&M factory <laughs> two kilometers away, and it was producing all these different kind of colors of honey. So we know that bees are exquisitely sensitive to what's in their environment, and this is a kind of trivial example. Um, this is a less trivial example if you're a mouse. Um, these two mice are genetically identical, but they look different. Not only do they kind of, this one's brown, this one's yellow, I mean, okay, but you can see that this one is obese, this one's not. And what you can't see is that this mouse is actually very sick, it has diabetes, it's predisposed to cancer, whereas this mouse is healthy. They come from the same mum. This is mum. And when mum gives birth, she produces a litter like this. And this is the healthy mouse, and then this one here are the, are the, are the, are the mice that aren't so well. But all these mice are genetically identical. And not only that, but if, if you give mum some food and you give her a normal mouse diet, but you supplement it with folic acid, vitamin B12, and choline, she only produces mouse that, mice that look like this. So the diet mum has, while she's pregnant, can influence what the offspring look like. So we know there's a link between nutrition and diet and epigenetics. And it's the same in humans as well, that, that all these little jelly tots that I told you about are actually derived from things like methionine and other amino acids that we eat. So you really are what you eat with epigenetics. And we know that this organism has taken it to its extreme. The honeybee controls its entire development based on diet. And I don't know of any other organism that has evolved such an extreme nutritional uh, directed phenotype than the honeybee. And so the question is, is there anything in the royal jelly diet that we can link to these changes that I've been telling you about? And that's what my lab is mainly working on at the moment. And in order to do that, unfortunately, we, we, we kind of still do this um, and this, but we do more of this and we take the grubs as soon as they hatch at first instar, or sometimes the eggs, and we put them in dishes. Uh, and this is a video I, I got from a colleague which shows a time lapse of how we grow our bees in a dish. 
And again, it's worth just having a, a look at this. And it's kind of like high throughput. So we can we put all the first instar larvae in dishes. We can change their diet while they're in here. They're literally swimming in their diet like they do in, uh, in the hive. And there they go. Look at them. They really do like their food. And you can also see the variation here, right? Even though these larvae are all taken at exactly the same age, you can see that it's not uniform. There's, there's nice variation within this. Now you can see them starting to harden and their, their cuticles starting to form. Pop. Almost like the video I showed you before, except a little bit more sterile, right? <clears throat> And then you start to get the color development in their eyes. I normally speed this up a little bit, but, but now you can see in a minute that they're going to start emerging. What a beautiful sight. <clears throat> And there we go. And moving away from the hive and using the hives just to produce queens or, or, or to produce grubs of the right age so that we can then they go crazy, um, is how we can manipulate their diet. And one molecule we focused on is something called HDA, which you may have heard of. And the reason why you may have heard of this, so this is a fatty acid, and it can account for up to kind of 6% dry weight, weight of royal jelly. So it's extremely abundant. And the reason you might have heard of it is because it's been heavily marketed as, as like the panacea of royal jelly. And I could have chosen a thousand examples from the internet, but I, I thought I got this one because it's kind of amusing. Uh, a powerful fatty acid in royal jelly. 10-HDA is powerful, essential fatty acid, only found in royal jelly and cannot be made artificially. Well, we buy it from here, um, <laughs> which is Cayman Chemicals, and it costs about 300 quid for a gram. Um, so it can be bought, or if, it can be bought if, you, if you want it. It has many uses. Um, they've been the most important chemical in royal jelly. Hmm, maybe. Um, it's the amount of 10-HDA content within royal jelly that it takes the price on the international market. That the higher the 10 HDA, the higher the price, but you can squirt it in. Uh, our royal jelly is record as the highest recorded strength, probably also not true. There's somebody that sells it with a reported 6%. Do not buy royal jelly if you do not know the 10 HDA content. That I agree with, and actually we do assay our royal jellies to see what the HDA content is, because we think this could be a key ingredient of what's making a queen a queen. And this queen bee acid, as it's called, has suddenly become like this marketing tool for all kinds of cosmetics and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this is what it looks like. So it's a saturated, it's a non-saturated decanoic acid, if you're kind of uh, into that thing. It's not particularly spectacular. But what happens if you start to feed it to bees that are developing down this pathway? because they obviously don't get 10 HDA, it's only in royal jelly. And our preliminary experiments have shown actually that if you, if you kind of start growing grubs in dishes and feed them what we would call kind of a polony mix, i.e. kind of a worker diet, and you supplement it with this 10 HDA, then you have a huge effect on their growth rate. And more significantly, if you look at the jelly tots on the marshmallows, and this, it doesn't really matter what this is, but just to show you, that if you look at uh, grubs that have been fed no HDA, and you look at grubs where you've actually added HDA, then you can see by the intensity that you've got much more of these jelly tots in the larva that have been fed HDA than the ones that aren't. I.e., this is a molecule in royal jelly that can have an effect on the genes in a developing worker. And we're still studying this molecules to see whether this could be one of the key features. So hopefully I've shown you that, that you know, there's, there's a lot of excitement in biology at the minute about this kind of new field that's called epigenetics, which can mean many things and can mean nothing. 
um, especially in human biology, and I showed you some of that, but especially in the study of honeybees and, and the understanding of, of how diet and nutrition can really dictate honeybees. So I should acknowledge the bees. These are just a few of our, our nukes uh, and, and normal colonies. This is, <laughs> yeah, this is the East London. Um, some of the hives have better views than others. Um, so this one has quite a nice view. This is on the roof of the university, although we're now uh, they're building us a bespoke bee facility, which is quite nice. Because on the roof, they're okay, they're happy, but I think they probably could be happier. So we're moving down to ground level. And these are people that do the work. Um, this is some of the people that have done the work I presented to you today, especially uh, Marek uh, and Dinyal and Nancy. This uh, very youthful looking individual is, is a brilliant computational scientist that does a lot of the analysis for us. We have collaborators in Australia, which is really handy during the winter if we still need bees. Uh, and a big shout out to the funders that, that have funded our work and, and continue to fund our work. And for you for inviting me here today. Thank you very much. Have you looked at what happens when workers become laying workers? So we are doing a little bit of work on, on those. We call them rebel workers. I don't know whether that would be there. The beekeeping term, more of an annoyance, <laughs> I guess is probably the beekeeping term. So yes, we have collected samples actually this summer from a nuke that, that uh, developed um, egg laying workers. Probably, well, I don't think it was because of our negligence, it's just sometimes we seem to get queen rearing nukes that where suddenly they start, uh, the workers starting to lay. So yes, we have collected material from those, but I can't tell you anything about it yet. But yeah, it's something that we're interested in and, and we have got those samples. On a less serious note, has anybody contemplated what the high consumption of the uh, decanoic acid in humans might be? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't eat it, put it that way. Uh, I wouldn't eat royal jelly either. Uh, when you see how powerful it is as a naturally evolved substance, it's astonishing, really. And if you think the millions of years over which honeybees have developed this beautiful nutrition that is royal jelly. It's astonishing. And of course, it's probably not going to be just one thing that contributes to this queen worker divide. A lot of studies, and we've done some actually, that if you look at this decanoic acid, then we've not fed it to humans because that tends to be more difficult. But what we have done is that we've used it on things like stem cells. So you can grow stem cells in a dish and you can make stem cells develop into different cell types. And HDA actually is something that accelerates that and can cause it. And that kind of makes sense because that's probably what it's doing in the bee, right? It's causing different programs of development. And if you add it to human cells in a dish, it does a similar thing. Cool. Can I go a little bit further? Yeah. And having accepted that it's the uh, um, HDA that's making the difference, what influences the worker bees to give this to certain larvae and not others? Wouldn't we be amazing to know? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, and what, what it is true is that the amount of HDA in royal jellies does vary quite significantly throughout the season and also throughout the world. Um, so, you know, it is highly variable, which is one interesting uh, point. The, sec the point of, <laughs> you know, what makes the bees select a queen or, or grub, uh, you know, um, sorry, I've forgotten the start of the question. What makes the workers do that? We don't know. I think answers to that are probably going to come from tagging bees. Um, there's a brilliant guy in Germany um, who's doing work at the moment where they actually have a colony running all the way through the year and they tag every single bee that emerges in that colony and it has a little barcode on its back, and they have hundreds of cameras set up inside the hive, and they can follow every single bee for an entire season. And they've just published a fantastic paper, and the complexity, as any beekeeper would know, but the complexity within the hive is astonishing and astounding. And obviously they can film when we're asleep, when the hive's covered up, the bees are not being disturbed other than when they're tagged. And I think that the question, the answer to the question you're asking is gonna come from something like that. When we can actually monitor in real time, every second, the life of a worker honeybee in the hive. And that's happening right now. And that is something that will, that I think will answer your question. Thank you. 
Um, one other question. You've spoken very much about the nutrition mm. um, and the change in nutrition. Is there anything with regards to the orientation? Because obviously with the queen cells, they are different from worker cells. Do you know what? That's something that I've pondered myself. Is it just the space in the hive and, and you know, the size of the animal that has to grow in there and therefore growing it kind of, you know, vertically rather than horizontally like everything else? Is that it? Um, or is there something about the orientation? And I did think actually that one really cool experiment would be somehow to put a hive on a spinner. So you're constantly spinning the hive around to see whether they actually, um, you know, that that disorientation actually makes them build the queen cell in a different way. Um, but I don't know, I don't know, I can't answer that. I suspect that yes, it is important. How long does it take from the queen laying the egg? until the bee is able to work on. And does environmental conditions or climate conditions have an effect on the length of time? Yeah, we do see quite a lot of variability actually, you know, during bee development. And I think you saw it a little bit on, on the video of the bees growing in dishes. I mean, we take bees eggs or first instar larvae that, that we know are within less than an hour of each other in terms of age. But yet you can see even in a controlled environment where temperature's the same, the light's the same, the food is all from the same kind of pot, if you like, that you still get quite a significant amount of variation in the speed of development. You know, I don't know why that is. It's probably just part of the natural variation in the system. But we do see quite a big variation in the time in the lab, and therefore in the hive, I'm sure there's even more variation. But if you've got a uh, different forage, mm. how much is that likely to make any difference to the um, uh, uh, to the larval food? And I was thinking particularly of uh, floral uh, sources and perhaps honeydew. Would there be any difference between those? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly not my area, but I, but I know that that Jerry Wright at Oxford is someone that studies this a lot, and the different composition. Um, of forage and how it affects ultimately the royal jelly composition as well, as well as food for workers. And yeah, it has a profound and massive effect. The only thing I would say though is that, uh, is that this process still happens, right? No matter what their forage is, they still seem to produce a substance called royal jelly that can separate these two developmental pathways. So how important the absolute composition of royal jelly is in determining queen worker, I don't think it's that important. Um, it may be more to do with, with other molecular events that are taking place, like you know, the strength of the resulting queen or the fitness of the resulting queen. But this kind of queen or worker through nutrition seems to be largely independent of kind of seasonal and regional variations in the royal jelly.